been thinking a little bit about the rhythms of life and the, the, the quick passing of time, the, the, the evenings, the mornings. It's not often I'm up and about early, and, but, but sometimes it's really refreshing in those moments. Sometimes the first thing I do in the morning is a quick tour of the garden, see how the plants are doing, maybe talk to them. It um, doesn't take long, it's only a small garden, but I don't know if you've ever listened to the bird song before the busyness of the day before the build-up of traffic on the road. Take time, even there now this morning, listen. Take time to, there's all sorts of noises. The birds are singing, they're tweeting, they're chirping. They're intermittently interrupted by a shriek or a cry. There's the occasional squawk. Maybe even a woodpecker knocking on the wood. Um, there's also in the morning a crispness often in the air. It wasn't quite the bright morning I was hoping for, but it's... There's still a, a, a freshness in the air. Um, it's a new day, a blank slate with new possibilities. Sometimes there's dew on the grass, the, a fresh, cool start as the new day dawns. There was something in the scriptures I read during the week that in the Book of Lamentations that brought this to mind again. And, and the poet was saying something that, of God's character that was fresh every morning. And the framework of this book is, is probably is interesting. It's not unlike the times we find ourselves in. The poet was lamenting actually the fall of Jerusalem. And he's, he's almost writing a funeral dodge to the state of the city. Not only was it in decline, but it was a rock bottom at his, the time he was writing. And the, the people were on their knees. And he claims to be downcast. But this is what he recalls to mind that gives him hope. Um, he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders, and perhaps you have too. But listen to his words. In the middle of a book where he's, he's lamenting, he's, he's crying out to God, he's, he's almost complaining about the state of everything around him. He has this gem in the middle. He says, Because of the mercies of the Lord, we will not be consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I can see, picture the poet, can't you? You can picture him just on his own early one morning, contemplating all the struggles and circumstances of his life and those around him. And yet this is what grounds him. It roots him. There are two opposite sides here to God's loyal love. His mercy that withholds, that he, that withholds what we really deserve and God's compassion that never fails us. He realizes that in this fallen world, if God had no mercy, we'd be finished. We'd be wiped out. Yet for all that had gone wrong for him and perhaps for all that has gone wrong for you and for me, we've not yet been wiped out, have we? In addition, just as one sunrise quickly follows the sunset the night before, re repeatedly, so God's compassions are new every morning. They are recreated, multiplied, rejuvenated daily. His compassion for you and me is limitless and never failing. He exclaims, in, in, almost with joy, he says, great is your faithfulness. What's faithfulness? It's, it's the steadfastness, the unchangingness of God, the, the love of God that never lets us go. And that's in contrast, isn't it, to an ever-changing world that is fickle and unreliable. And, it, and when you scan the, the biblical horizon, if you like, you, you, it, the, the cross of Jesus Christ stands in the, on, the, on the timeline of history like this gigantic monument to both the mercy and the compassion of God. And at the cross, the justice, of, the justice of God intersects the love of God. His mercy is evident as Jesus pays the debt we owe instead of us facing all the consequences for our sins. And the love of God is expressed in Jesus' willingness to be there in the first place on our behalf. There is no greater demonstration of love in the entire universe or in our entire history there is no longer any justification for doubting God's relentless love for you and me. The poet asserts then in verse 38, and he is really helpful, he says, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? In a sense, he's arguing, surely God has the right to do whatever he likes. And, and, and one of the things that struck me is life's a bit like a bed of roses. Now, that has maybe perhaps different meaning for some and others, but I can remember falling off a bicycle into a bed of roses, and I can tell you, it's sore, it hurts. But that's our experience of reality and life, isn't it? Trouble comes, and it will. 
but does that mean that God's love has let us go, that his love has dried up like a stream in a desert? No. But it, it, but his love, he says, I have to say, and his love is constantly refreshed every morning. We can't measure God's love by our circumstances, nor should we ever do so. He meets us in the mess and the middle of life's circumstances if we are willing to wait for him. And he's these lovely words in verse 24, The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. And I would challenge us and encourage you this morning to allow the moments of morning beauty to focus our gaze on the loyal, unfailing love of God and on Jesus who wants and longs to restore us. God is his portion and God can be our portion, our lot and all that we need. There is rest, there is satisfaction and contentment in this place because we find God in the midst of the muddle and the mess of life. And here is the poet's concluding desire. Restore to us yourself, Lord, that we may return. And uh, may that be an encouragement to you this morning to, 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 to as you, as you, and next time you, you face the morning and the early morning and hear the bird song, like we're listening to there this morning. Have a listen to that. May you remember the relentless, never failing love of God for us. I'm your host, Matt Totterby of Bundoran Bible Reflections. God bless you this week.